we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Good morning, Warren Church of Christ. I'm so glad you came to worship, worship with us today. If you all don't know, this is Youth-Led Sunday. It is probably, maybe besides Christmas and Easter, like my favorite Sunday of the year because I get to watch all of our awesome kids use the talents God gave them to help us worship God together. So before we get started, I'm going to invite Misty Kern up here. She has an announcement about caring for kids. Thank you. Real quick, um, so you may have noticed the tree at the back of the sanctuary, so please visit that, um, our blessing tree, as it's called now. Um, uh, just same procedure as all years past. Take a, an angel, uh, shop for that, return it with the angel attached. Uh, some people like to leave it in the plastic sack, shopping bag, and attach the angel to that. So do that. Bring it um, back to the tree. Maybe stick it under there or give it to uh, somebody in the office, Ethan or, or Andrew, if you're not comfortable leaving it back there. So uh, again, remember to visit the tree. Um, a couple announcements regarding our, our um, normal participation in this ministry. Uh, last year, COVID kind of taught us uh, a better way for distribution. And um, what, they d what we ended up doing last year was um, families would drive up behind Jennifer's Closet, the building that is uh, on site there at Markle Church of Christ. And uh, the ministry loved that way. It was a lot easier. And then resources um, for wrapping um, can be used elsewhere throughout the ministry. So there isn't any wrapping again this year. That's okay, because again, those resources can be used elsewhere. Um, the gifts are given to the families to wrap themselves, so they have more ownership there and, and maybe um, a little more dignity, and maybe that feels a little bit better to them. Um, but um, distribution day will be as we did it last year on Friday and Saturday uh, in the evening on Friday, 4 to 7, Saturday. Uh, last year, we did it in the morning, and that's very cold in December. So uh, we are starting at noon on Saturday this time, from noon to 3. Um, so food packing looks a little different as well. So um, we won't be packing on Sunday after church as we have uh, two years past and before. Um, we will be packing on a Wednesday night during small group. Um, and so if you would like to join us, please see me for more details about that. It'll be on Wednesday the 15th before distri distribution day on December 17th. Again, that was really quick. Any questions at all, please see me. Now it is time to open the service with a prayer. Dear God, thank you for letting us be able to come to church, letting us be able to worship you, and thank you for letting us go to heaven and for having your son die so that we could be with you. Amen. Won't you stand while we worship the Lord this morning? Actually, you can stay seated because <laughs> my wife can't read. I have an announcement. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Ethan, I don't know where he's at. He's here somewhere. There he is. Ethan is our longest serving minister here at Warren Church of Christ. Um, and as he prepares to move on, um, we have started to get some questions um, as to what goes on uh, to find a new minister. Um, it's been 12 years. We've been, we are extremely grateful that we've had 12 years with Ethan and Misty. And 
even some of us veterans may not remember how that process works. So I'm going to run through that real quick um, and interrupt this youth-led service. I'm, I'm not a youth anymore, apparently. Um, so how this works is the when the minister gives his resignation, um, the chairman of the board, that's me, uh, elects a search team committee. And then the search team committee is responsible for um, advertising and collecting the um, resumes of new ministers. We don't have, we are a completely independent Church of Christ. Um, there is no big group of guys somewhere in another town that just sends us another minister. That's not how it works with us. Um, so we will collect the resumes and then we will also conduct interviews. Um, and then once that process, once we have narrowed it down, um, the search team may actually go and listen to them preach um, and meet with them. And then once we have a few candidates, we will actually have them here to the building and they will do trial sermons here and we can meet with them. After that, um, we will uh, do a little bit more investigation, follow up on contacts and different things, make sure that um, their references check out um, and then the you guys, the congregation, we vote on who we want as the next minister. Um, if anybody has any questions about that process, uh, you can talk to me, you can talk to John Morrison. Um, we are happy to answer your questions. I will tell you that the search team has been formed. Uh, we have already met and uh, we are putting out the word uh, that we need to hire a new minister. So um, that is what's going on so far. I will be giving you updates. I can tell you um, from what we've been hearing from the places that we've contacted um, that this may not be the, a, quick and easy, a quick and easy search. Um, there seems to be a shortage of ministers looking for, looking for work right now. Um, so we hope that you will continue to hang in, hang in there with us in this process as we go through it. Um, but we know that uh, God is already preparing our next minister to come here and serve with us. So with that, I'll give it back to you. And won't you stand with us? Thank you. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. See shoulders of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. In the sun's upper loss. From Stand up, stand up. 
to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us.
Now we're 
time, we invite you to participate in communion with us in celebrating our Lord's uh, death and resurrection. You'll find baskets here at the front um, and at the back. Uh, so please get those and return to your seat. Church of Christ. Does anybody know what this is? Yes, you're right. It's a wedding ring. Do you know whose wedding ring this is? It's my dad's wedding ring. Do you want to know something funny? My dad loses this wedding ring all the time. He'll lose it for a few days, a few weeks or even for a month. But after 15 years of mom and dad's marriage, it's always been found. We find, da we find dad's wedding ring under the bed, in the van, and sometimes when we're searching for toys in the couch, you know what we find? It's dad's wedding ring. <laughs> this reminds me of a really cool thing that Jesus does for us. We're like the wedding ring. We get lost, but Jesus finds us. Luke 15 is one of those chapters with lots of cool stories about how God loves us and wants, to be, wants us to be found. Jesus tells the story about a man. This man is a shepherd. Jesus says that this shepherd has 100 sheep. He says that when one of the sheep goes missing, that the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep and goes searching for one of them. Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man, which is Jesus, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We are taking a moment to take communion and thank Jesus for dying on the cross so each sinner who is lost can be forgiven, found. At this time, would you take the bread in remembrance of Jesus' body. And the blood to remember Jesus' blood on the cross. Will you pray with us? God, thank you for this day. Thank you for everybody that gets to be here. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross with us. Amen. Let's pray for the offering. Dear Lord, thank you that all, or we hope that all the money will go to good use, and we just pray that you can do good things with the money that we're giving to offering, and just do good with it. Amen. Okay, now we have some prayer requests and updates. So I wanted to just offer a personal thank you to all the many people who made our Trunk or Treat a success. We had 12 different stations for kids to go and get treats and candy, and we had awesome uh, helpers inside handing out hot dogs and drinks, and we saw a lot of community people um, we got to establish some relationships and meet some great people, and that's what Trunk or Treat is really all about, is showing love to the community and uh, presenting ourselves as, as friends and allies and people who love them. So I just want to thank you very much. That was so great. We had a lot of fun. Um, and to all the people who donated candy, we had, we had a lot of candy, so much candy. So we're going to be handing out candy in every treat bag we can think of for the next six months because we got lots of candy. Okay, Ellie Heim is here. Yep, I heard that. Uh, she's going to talk for just a minute about these fun red and green boxes. So do you know what these boxes are for? Operation Christmas Christmas Child. Absolutely. Operation Christmas Child through Samaritan's Purse. So you can tell us in your own words what we are doing with these boxes. What we are doing with the boxes is we are sending them to kids who can't afford enough money to buy stuff. 
So we're getting different stuff for them so they can so they can experience God's love for us. We love this project. We've done it for years and years and years. Um, this is sort of the first opening gift in a child's life. A lot of these families are so poor in these countries that they've never been able to give their child a gift before. Kids don't have shoes so they can go to school. They don't have basic supplies they need, and they certainly have never gotten a luxury like a present, like a toy. And so uh, what Operation Christmas Child does is they, this is like the first if the only message they ever get out of this is that somebody somewhere loves them because of the love of God, they've done their job. That they got this gift because God has influenced the life of someone somewhere enough that they want to share love with somebody they've never met. And then through this, they offer a 12-week discipleship course where a lot of kids hear for the very first time about God and Jesus. And so it's in their own language, people from their own country teaching them the gospel, and then they get a Bible in their own language at the end of this 12-week program. And so this is sort of just the opening salvo in a discipleship program that has impacted lives, millions of lives across the country. So next week, what are we doing with these boxes, Ellie? Uh, we're putting Operation Christmas Child stuff in there. Right. We're going to be packing these boxes, but every box that we pack requires a $9 donation to ship it. And so we're going to have a bunch of students next Sunday morning running around with empty boxes with an opportunity for you guys to give a love offering to help us fund these boxes. I think our record was 60 some boxes one year and that's a lot of money that it takes to ship these boxes. And so you guys come prepared next week because we're going to have some very eager and excited students running around with empty boxes hoping that you'll help contribute to shipping them across the world. Okay, with the fun stuff, here's Evan to share some prayer requests. I'm going to share some special prayer requests. First, we have Marsha Crickard. Crickard? Um, she has a hip replacement on November 10th, which is Wednesday. And then Jim Goff, um, who is Joe Hartley's friend, has prostate cancer. Um, Kathy... Kathy Kwiatkowski. Um who is Kim Jordan's mom. Um, we need some prayers for her heart's health, as it is not doing great right now. And then Wayne Thompson, who is Joe Hartley's friend, has stage 3 kidney failure. He is also diabetic and pan what's pan yep. pan pancreatitis, and he has pancreatitis. So uh, we need prayers for these people as they struggle through what they're going through. And we just need prayers that they will um, be in good health. Good job. At the bottom of the back of your bulletin are also um, three other events that we've got going on. The Adventure Bible's up here for students. We're looking for sponsors for those. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet to ring bells for the Salvation Army, and also the Holiday Walk and Festival of Trees is coming up soon, and I know Vicki would really appreciate some help providing snacks and some help that day. I have a note here from the family of Faye Cartwright, and I would like to share this with you guys. It says, Dear Church Family, Thank you for all the love shown to Faye prior to her passing with visits, cards, and prayers. Thank you, too, for the funeral dinner and to those who prepared and served it to us. And that's from Brian Pinkerton, Carol Keen, and Mark Pinkerton and their families. I know, um, having talked to this family, that a little card just doesn't express the, the love that they felt and that Faye has felt over the years. It's been a long battle and there have been a lot of ups and downs and I know um, one little card maybe didn't express everything they wanted to say but I know that they deeply appreciate and love our church family and, and they really are thankful for everything you know that we've done for Faye and that we do for each other. So if you guys would join with me in prayer, we'll pray for all of all the things we've talked about. Father God, you know some days our hearts are just heavy and some days we are filled with joy and we understand that this is all a part of the experience of being humans here on earth. God, we've had triumphs and we've had struggles and there are those in our family and in our lives who are up against battles. And God, we ask that in every situation 
that your will would be known and that your grace would be shown and that that through every situation that your kingdom would grow and that your love would be manifested in the earth. We ask for healing for those who are sick and we ask for comfort for those who are mourning and we, we ask that we could join in the joy of those who are rejoicing. Uh, we ask too that, that you would bless all of our efforts here at the church um, as we do our best to reach the kingdom for you. And God, we ask that you would bless the rest of this service and that your presence would be known here. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, this morning, I was uh, talking to Laura a couple weeks ago, and this idea had popped in my head, like, hey, what if I would do something totally different for the beginning of my message today? Uh, so today, for the first uh, 15 minutes or so of my message, I'm actually going to interview some of our students that participated in the, the Bible reading challenge that we had a couple weeks ago. Uh, so I kind of wanted to get some insight on what they learned from that. Uh, so we will have uh, our students come up here in a little bit. Uh, we read through the book of James, if you guys didn't uh, know that. And so I gave all of them the questions before so they wouldn't be blindsided about what I was going to ask and they could kind of prepare their answers. So today, uh, if you guys could come forward, we have Caitlin and Ella Lar, Elsa Fortney, and Evan Kern. So they can have a seat up here. Evan, you can grab that microphone right there. That one right there. The short one. The short one on the end. There you go. Pull the whole stand out. Pull the stand out. Put the stand in front of you. There you go. And I got water for them in case they get thirsty too. So. All right. So uh, during this kind of different sermon. I hope you guys enjoy uh, some of their answers that they, that they give over the, the book of James. So the first question that I have, you okay there, Caitlin? You're not going to spin around, are you? No. Okay. So the first question I have is, have you guys ever read through the book of James before? And we'll start with Caitlin. Well, no, but I liked it. Okay. So. Okay, Ella has. No. No. Okay. So, Caitlin, since you were the actually Caitlin and Ella, since you guys were the only ones that have read through the book, uh, was there something that you guys liked about it? So, I liked just the fact that you know it. I don't know, that it teaches it teaches you about like what you or how you should live like a godly life and how you should be like wise in your decisions. Um, I really liked how it talked about in chapter one verses two through eight how the testing of your faith produces perseverance which can lead to um, maturity and being complete. Okay so this question is for all of you. Uh, what are some things that you learned through your reading? So we'll start down with Evan now. Um, I learned that those who teach are going to be judged more strictly than those who don't. Okay. Um, just that we need to be like wise in what we say and put God before everything else because you can't, when you die, you can't take your um, material up to heaven with you. All right. So Ella, you kind of uh, mentioned this, uh, but in chapter one, uh, James talks about kind of testing our faith, and what does some of this testing produce? So anybody can answer that, but since you kind of brought it up first, you can go ahead. 
Perseverance. Okay, perseverance. Um, a str- just a stronger relationship with God. Nothing? It's all right. Um, it produces steadfastness. Um, and like um, Caitlin said, a stronger rela- relationship with God. So how could, how could this testing, how could it make our faith stronger? Anybody? Get us closer to God, like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. gets us closer to God. Evan, you look like you want to say something over there. Just hold the microphone. <laughs> you looked like you wanted to talk. Okay. So the end of chapter 2, we're just going to go kind of chapter by chapter here. The end of chapter 2, James talks about uh, how our faith and works kind of go together. So starting with Caitlin, what is uh, something that kind of stuck out to you while reading the passage about faith and works? So, like, you can't just say, you know, you believe in God, but then, like, and say you have faith in him, but then, like, not show that faith to other people and um, not live it out. Um, So the things that stuck out to me were the two examples he gave um, that included um, Abraham and his sacrifice of Isaac and then telling a brother or sister to stay warm and well-fed, but you don't do anything to take care of their physical needs. Um, What stuck out to me was faith without works is dead. Like, you can believe in God, but by not taking action, your faith is just worthless. Okay. So in James 2.19, he says, even the demons believe and they shudder at the name of God. So what does this kind of tell you guys about the power of God, the presence of God, stuff like that? Right, Caitlin. That, um, you know, he's just so powerful. And, like, something that stuck out to me is that, like, the demons know he's real. So, I mean, they know they're going to, like, not make it in the end. So, I mean, they know there's, like, no point, I guess. But they keep trying. Even though they're not going <laughs> to. Yeah, they know they're not going to win in the end. But they still keep keep going. Anybody else have anything to add? All right. Cool. So chapter 3, probably one of, if not the most famous chapters uh, in in the Bible, talking about how we can tame our tongues and some of the things that the tongue can do. So he has several metaphors in this chapter about uh, what... He compares the tongue. So we'll start with Evan. What are, his, what are some of the metaphors that, that he compares the tongue to? He compares the tongue to a ship and a rudder, like with us being the ship and um, the rudder being the tongue. And he also compares us and the tongue to a forest and a fire. Um, I pretty much had the same thing as Evan. A great forest starts with a small fire. Um, I had the example of the bits in a horse's mouth. Okay. Um, I put fire and a deadly poison. Okay. So then next in James 4, uh, he kind of gives us some things that we need to avoid. And what are those things? And what should we do instead, Caitlin? Like leave from the devil and like look to God okay um so we shouldn't have a desire to have like something that other people do which would lead to killing um don't treat people like dirt and instead treat treat them like you would treat other people in a good way you should humble yourself okay and then in the very last chapter James chapter 5 Uh, What does he say about wealth? Evan, start with you. 
he says that riches, um, while they seem good, they bring misery and greed, and it will corrode your mind. Mm -hmm. um, people are pleased m more when things are simple, but when they have more, you are not satisfied. Um, he talks about how it leads to luxury and self-indulgence. So, like I said earlier, like it said, I read that you know, like you're they're gonna. There's really no point for your material things up in heaven because you can't take them with you. So again, like don't be like so. Don't be like so like um, full of yourself, I guess, because you have everything that you know other people don't. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have one more question that I didn't put on the paper, but it's a really easy question. So you guys were all reached out to by an adult during the challenge, right? Okay, so what is one thing that you guys enjoyed about talking to an adult and some of the things that uh, you possibly learned from them and they could have learned from you? Caitlin? Like, I, like it's always just been easier for me to talk to adults, so... When I talked to Peg Morrison, she like made it easy for like me to understand what she was saying like in her text. So, um, yeah. Um, I like how when you get done reading it, it allows you to have an opportunity to have a reflection over what you read with someone who has a better understanding of the stuff said in the chapter. Um, I had this work and um, in the text she it was really guiding me through it, and so I could understand it better than I would if I was reading it by myself. Um, I also had Miss Liz, and she was, A, reminded me to do it, <laughs> <laughs> and B, um, she really put it in much more simple terms that I could understand, because some of the things in the Bible just kind of don't make sense if you look at it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys have anything else to add? If not, you guys can, if you guys are thirsty, you guys can grab a water and head back to your seats. Good job, guys. <laughs> you want a water? You can have one, since they didn't take it. I almost made it. You can take it if you want. That one almost slid off too. All right. So I just wanted to do something different for you guys uh, this morning uh, to get, since it is Youth Sunday, to get as many of our students uh, involved as we could. Uh, just kind of uh, have them share what they learned through the past week. And... This is, this is one thing that is kind of exciting to me, uh, getting people to read the Bible. We're going to do another one of these challenges um, in January, and I, it would be really, really cool if we could get the whole church involved, um, having more adults reaching out and connecting with our young kids, um, just connecting with them through the week. You don't have to do it every single day. You can do it once a week at the end of the week, or you could do it three times a week. It doesn't really, it's kind of based on your schedules. So um, one of the adults that uh, actually helped out this past time, she told me that while she was reading through, uh, she was also reaching out to her granddaughters along with one of our students here from church. And she was just really excited. Uh, she told me, I think it was last week, that she really enjoyed uh, connecting with this younger generation. So this is really what youth ministry is all about. It's not just about me. It's not just about what Liz does. It takes a whole congregation to reach out and disciple the next generation that is coming up. So it should be Kids connecting with adults, adults connecting with kids, and this is where the real discipleship 
uh, actually happens. So if you would turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, we're going to be reading verses 24 to 29. And verses 28 and 29 will actually sound a little bit familiar to you because that is what Caden read to start the service today. So verse 24 says, now I, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for the ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28, in him, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. So in these five verses, uh, Paul is kind of telling us what his goal of ministry is. He says that suffering for Jesus is unavoidable when we take the good news of Christ to the world. And this suffering also can be endured joyfully because it changes lives and brings people into Christ's kingdom. Uh, in our small groups, we've been going through the book, So the Next Generation Will Know. And uh, there is a quote in this book, in I think it was chapter 4, that really stuck out to me. And it says, it's a quote by uh, a man named David Kinneman, which says, People who have a biblical worldview are much more likely to act like Jesus because they see such things as life, people, and crisis differently than most people do. And the authors uh, of the book, then they go on to say, if we want to help young Christians live like Jesus, we need to help them see the world as Jesus did. We need to equip them with a biblical understanding of reality and help them develop spiritual practices that ingrain those beliefs into their lives and character. So if we want the church to not exist anymore, then all we need to do is nothing. Just sit on our hands and do nothing. And if we aren't reaching the next generation of people, which is everyone sitting right here, several upstairs, if we're not reaching them, then the church is not going to exist anymore. And we've all heard, there's this saying, we've all heard it, that the church is only one generation from extinction. And this is true. More and more people are falling away from the church. They don't want to be a part of the church because they see Christians as hypocrites. They, they see Christians as people who don't live the way they're talking about, and that is really turning these people off. And as Ethan mentioned last week, there are 58% of this next generation that's coming up that think there is another way to heaven. And to me, this is really sad, and it shows that the church as a whole has not done a good job in reaching the generations to come and the generations that are following. And if we want uh, this next generation to be followers of Jesus, if we want them to um, be, parts of, be a part of the church, be leaders in the church, uh, we all, including myself, including the leadership, Liz, everybody, we uh, need to uh, change the way that we approach them. So at the end of September, I went to a youth ministry retreat uh, up in Wheaton, Illinois, it was put on by a, a company that helps out uh, youth ministries, giving them resources and stuff like that called Leader Treks. 
And so this, this retreat was called Leading from the Driver's Seat. And during the three days that I was up there, we learned a lot about how we can reach the next generation of people coming up. And one thing that really stuck out to me was this upcoming generation really wants to build relationships with people older than them. They want to talk about themselves, okay? So they like to talk about themselves, building these meaningful relationships. And one way that we can build these relationships with this generation is asking them discovery questions. So like asking them questions about their life, asking them questions about their family, so on and so forth. And then this way they were able to build the trust of the adult so that way more discipleship can actually happen in their lives. And Leader Trex has a really cool uh, discipleship model that we all, uh, they gave to us and we got to bring home. And actually it's on the next slide and I thought I would like, and I would like to share some of this with you guys. So as you can see, building trust um, asking those discovery questions, which will in turn build the meaningful relationships, and then grace, which we show the disciple a... Actually, the disciple experiences a vulnerability after we share a personal story with them. And then next, we go from the discovery questions to intentional questions, which challenges them to think on their own. And then change, you can't really see it, but that yellow says change. And so we make applications to our life and kind of our struggles and stuff, and then they will see their struggles. And then obedience, holding the students accountable, and then in turn, Sharpening, and there's a verse in Proverbs that says iron sharpens iron. And then that, the obedience, is actually the desired outcome as a discipler that we need to have. There's a, a statistic that says 80% of people that come to know Jesus are kids between the ages of 12 and 16. So this means that we need to be training our students to be missionaries in their schools and in their daily lives. Because every day we live in a mission field. The older the kids get, the older people get, the harder and harder it is to win them over to Jesus. Because then they start making uh, and forming their own opinions and getting more and more of their worldly influences in their lives. And as a church, we uh, need to do a better job of reaching these young people. So if you would like a copy of, uh, the, of this model, feel free to ask me, because I have, I have it so I can make copies if you would, if you would like it. So ultimately, uh, for my, not my youth ministry, because it's ultimately God's ministry. Ultimately, for the youth ministry, I would like to have a students or a youth ministry full of students that have a ministry in their own world. They're discipling other kids, bringing them to Jesus. They need to be bold in their faith and not afraid to tell others about who Jesus is and what he has done in their lives. Because with Jesus... There is nothing that they can't do. And so back to our verses here uh, for a little bit. There were a lot of false teachers in the church at Colossae. And they believed that spiritual perfection was a secret and hidden plan that only a few privileged people could discover. Their secret plan was meant to be exclusive. And Paul says that he is proclaiming the word of God in its fullness. So he is going away from what they thought was right to he is actually being inclusive and in teaching people about the gifts that he has gotten from Jesus. 
So he, Paul calls God's plan, uh, he calls it a mystery, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, not in the sense that only a few would understand, but because it was hidden until Jesus came. So through Christ, it was made open to everybody. God's secret plan is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God planned to have his son Jesus live in the hearts of all who believed in him, even Gentiles like the Colossians and us. Another excerpt that I really enjoyed from uh, the book, so the next generation uh, will hear or will know, says, Our job is to equip the next generation with knowledge of God, but it is not enough. We must also help young Christians to know that they know the truth. Our churches are filled with people who know the truth, but how many can explain how they know their beliefs are true? There aren't many, they say. The numbers are even less with Gen Z. Gen Z is the generation that's coming up, all of the kids that are in school right now. And this is important because confidence comes from merely knowing the, from, not merely from knowing the truth, but knowing that you know the truth. So they go on to give an example of two students who are taking a test. I'm sure you guys all love tests, right? Yes. Yeah. Tests, are, um, tests, are your, tests are your favorite, right? Yeah, I like how the homework is I mean, yeah, he's not wrong. <laughs> tests are better than homework, but... You guys have to study, right? You guys have to study a lot for a test. So he, they give the example of two students. One student studies and prepares for the test while the other student doesn't. Does that sound familiar yet? Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. It's not about one of you guys, I promise. So then they ask the question, which one is more likely to cultivate the right instincts and mark the correct answers? The obvious choice would be who? Us. The, one, the one that studies, right? And not only, uh, they, don't, they not only know the truth, but they also know that they know the truth or the right answers. So the message of Jesus is for everyone. And everywhere that Paul and Timothy go, they took the good news and brought it to everyone that would listen to what they had to say. When the gospel is presented effectively, it, it includes a warning and teaching. The warning is that without Christ, people are doomed to eternal separation from God. The teaching is that salvation is available through faith in Jesus, along with baptism. And as Christ works in us, we need to tell others about who he is warning and teaching them in love. So we all know uh, there some, there's somebody in our lives that needs to hear this message of Jesus Christ. Whether it's somebody who is in the next generation or whether it's one of our closest friends, somebody needs to hear the love of Jesus and the message of Jesus Christ. So as I close today, I would like to ask one simple question to everybody in here. How can I be someone that makes an impact for the next generation of Christians? Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day, and I just thank you for just everything that you have given us, and I pray that you would just help us to reach the next generation uh, just so that they will know more about you, help us to become disciplers. Uh, help us to be able to just be, be strong and bold and help and uh, tell others about who you are and what you have done in our lives. And again, we just thank you for everything that you have given us. And in Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. We had a request for the kids to please come down and join us if you'd like to come up front. It'd be great.
Oh!